So, yeah, you can. I, I can do that. I don't have my... Uh, um, Jen Dress is here. She must have... Where is... Do you have my statement? <laughs> Uh, let me just say we're going to be taking testimony from two witnesses in support and two witnesses against each bill, each having three minutes to speak. Other witnesses will just be asked to state their name, their, their organization, and their positions just for the record. I all ask everyone here to turn off your cell phone. That includes the chair, <laughs> who now just turned off his cell phone. And please take your conversations outside of the room uh, the, so that we can hear the testimony presented and hear the members when they cast their votes. Uh, let me begin as a, uh, All right. by my Satan. We're going to begin with Senator Lowenthal, Vehicles, Vehicle Mile Travel Fee, BMP. Senator, present at will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th what this bill does, SB 1299, is, to, is for DMV to conduct a study of the issues related to implementing a VMT fee and submit a report of its findings to the legislature by June 30th of 2012. Well, why is this bill important? Uh, as you are really aware that the principal source of revenue for transportation is derived from the excise fuel tax on. Uh, what we've seen is we've, sh after shifting from the sales tax on gasoline, more so now to the excise tax, when we do the excise tax, we're talking about uh, not so much the price of, of gasoline, but the actual amount of fuel that's consumed. We now know that as a state where we have policies to reduce our carbon footprint, to reduce, to increase efficiency, and so we will be consuming less and less gasoline in the future. Uh, in the, also with inflation, um, the value of this tax will, has diminished over time, having lost approximately 30% of its value between 1994 and today before our swap goes into effect. So the question is, are we going to plan for the future or at least understand what options the legislature has in terms of maintaining and sustaining an infrastructure, quality infrastructure, or are we going to be, continue to be reactive and wait until the, we, the revenue continues to drop from the excise tax? This does not, this bill does not take a position on whether this is good or not good to do the VMT. It just says that this has been one, this is one option. Let's find out now all the possibilities of using a vehicle mile as, if as this legislature in the future begins to deliberate, how are we going to be able to have a sustainable funding stream for our streets and roads? Uh, as we know, VMT has received more attention as a potential alternative. Secretary LaHood has mentioned it as a possibility. Uh, other states have begun, Oregon has already begun to do a study like this. Again, we are not proposing that this is the answer to do this. We are just saying 
we know that our existing funding stream will be declining in the future. People do not want to raise the tax on that. And so, and as the state of California moves more so to that the user pays for the services, that the general taxpayer does not pay for all of the services, as we move in this direction, this is just an option for us to understand. Uh, uh, and uh, that's really the reason. Uh, and again, I'm not here to endorse it or not to endorse this as to use the vehicle miles, uh, a VMT fee. It's just to study it, to do a pilot study, a pilot project, and to ask the uh, uh, the advocates, the people who are the transportation experts, and DMV to come back and to provide us with, with input, how, what are the issues involved in doing something like this? Can it be done? Should it be done? And then we'll answer that. And that's all that I've done to, and why I'm doing this. Bill. Senator Orpeza had a question. Is that something you want to ask now or I after? Can, I can wait until after the witnesses. So, so okay, why don't we do that that's and fine. we'll bring them back. Thank you very much. Witnesses in favor? Uh, <coughs> members, uh, Mark Watts on behalf of Transportation California, a coalition of contractors and allied labor. We support this legislation. We've long known that there was uh, um, uh, an issue with the declining purchase uh, uh, power of the gas tax and coupled with uh, the actual reduction in year-to-year -year sales of gasoline, we're seeing it, uh, that, that as a funding source decline. It's having a debilitating effect, as we all know, on, uh, our, for example, the shop program. You have a $6 billion annual need and we're funding it maybe at one-third or even less of the annual need and that means our highways are going into uh, deeper and steeper disrepair. I think a theme that the Senator mentioned that uh, if and when there's a time to talk about this, it would be well, we'd be well served to have analyzed and take a look at some of the issues. There are going to be issues on technology. There's going to be issues on just how you uh, implement uh, a VMT if that's going to be a, a pathway to go down. So we strongly support this measure, which starts the conversation going. And I'll be available to answer questions. Thank you. Next witness. Yeah. Uh, Steve Wallach on behalf of the Alameda Contra Costa Transit District. We also support this bill. We, this has been an issue that's been widely debated and discussed. We, we support this bill because it finally starts that process of determining if this is a feasible alternative uh, and how to address our tra transportation funding needs of the future and urge your support. Thank you. Other witnesses in favor? I'm Addison with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District in support. There are significant air quality consequences of uh, a VMT fee. We think it makes sense to look at the impacts that would have. Thank you. Any other witnesses in favor? Any witnesses opposed? Please step on up to the microphone if there's anybody. No, nope. just standing up. All right. Uh, we'll bring it back to the committee then. Senator Orpeza, you had a question or comment? Actually, it's, an, it's a comment. Uh, I, first of all, I want to applaud you for your leadership on this. I think it's you know, what, you're, what you're proposing to be studied here, I think, is uh, has been discussed, as was mentioned by the witnesses, for some time, uh, bandied about, but I, I don't, I have not aware of a study of California and its impacts here as a proposed uh, solution on our financing of uh, transportation infrastructure and transportation um, operations, for that matter. Um, I have not, I'm not aware of one, so I'm really, really thrilled that you're doing this. Um, for some time, I have had a conflicting feelings about um, about the policy that we have now, about how we finance um, transportation, because it really runs counter to the quote greening of California um, that we all hope for. Um, this kind of approach, I think, is probably a much greener it approach. Is. And so I'm, I'm very, very interested in it from that perspective as well. So I just wanted to say kudos. I think it's great, and I'm looking forward to learning what the outcomes are, because of course, then under your leadership, those will be the next steps. Right. We'll hold that thought just for a moment. We have a quorum. Let's do that, and then we can have your. We'll be waiting in rapt attention for your response. Please call the roll. Lowenthal. 
both here and I. <laughs> <laughs> Only here is appropriate I right now. Here. 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 I am here. Ashburn. Are we taking a role or are we, we just taking role? I'm present at the present. Desonier. Harmon. Kehoe. Hi, here. Oropeza. Here. Pavli. Simidian. Okay. And we have a quorum. And we have a quorum. We having established our Thank quorum, you. please respond to the I would like to respond to uh, Senator Oropesa's comments. And I, too, for some time have been concerned about how we finance transportation and that it seemed to be uh, at odds with some of the other goals of the state. And as we move in this, but I'm not e either on the, as I say, as we move in this direction, I realize there are some very major issues that still need to be dealt with. For some of them is how do we calculate the method mileage driven. That's a very serious question. I really just want to get input. I, um, the process by which that data that is calculated is then transmitted to the appropriate state agency or tax collection or however we collect that fee, very serious issue. Issue that leads to issues around privacy. Very serious kinds of issues that we'd have. Uh, how do we deal with contingencies about equipment failing? This is this is going to be. We're now going to be talking about new technologies to do this. I appreciate all that. I just really want to start to hear some of these answers at this point. Uh, again, I'm not advocating that a VMT a vehicle miles traveled is the best approach. I just see the future that we're having a declining funding stream. We're not going to be raising taxes in the near future. Let's look at what other options we have, and that's all this bill does. And I ask for your I vote. Any other questions or comments? Let me just say that I, I agree with your observation. I mean, it's clear to anybody we, while we're achieving higher vehicle efficiency, we have a declining, declining revenue at the time that more people are traveling more distance and having more wear and tear. So that is sort of a conundrum, particularly for those of us that don't like taxes. We don't like to raise taxes. And so it's this delicate balance we're in about how do you fund transportation, the level of people want it to be funded. Is it your expectation that this will be in addition to or in place of the existing tax structure? It could be either one. I do not really come advocating this. I come seeing that we have this declining revenue stream and that the legislature has just gone through. We've just seen now with the, with the change from the sales tax to the excise tax that we're putting our eggs in this basket. And I think what we have now is a solution for five years, really. That's really what we did. We bought five years' worth of time. It would be a shame that after five years that we have not really looked at what other alternatives we have. And so I don't know, Senator, whether it's that, whether it would be appropriate to entirely replace the excise tax on gasoline, the, the gas tax, whether it would be somehow we would try to figure out what our needs are and what, what, what meets the needs. As we did when we did the swap, we said that we would keep the amount of money for streets and roads equivalent to what we had before, whether we would do something like that. I'm just not sure at this time. But what I do know is just to wait and think that as the revenue stream declines, that we're just going to raise the excise tax and raise the tax is not an appropriate answer or, or tremendously limits us if that's the only answer that we have at this time. Well, I, I'm inclined to support your bill today, not that I'm advocating it, but I, I, I think am we I. do need to answer the question. I, I am hopeful that as they're doing the study on this, that they can look at ways to, for those of us that are concerned about revenues that are going to get raised in a majority vote or fluctuating on that, you know, how do they anticipate that? If you can, I think you can get a lot more broader support with the end product if you address the different things that are, you know, troubling us and, and you know, Senator, us on the cross. we have deliberately tried to not dictate what they should study, and I would welcome input from members of the committee, such as that question that you've just raised, that we can ask the DMV and the stakeholders to come together with and to work on that, and I would, I would welcome that input from members, because right. that's you. really what we're trying to do. Yep. Yeah. Senator Ashburn. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I understand that we're on the verge of a vote. However, 
in indicating that you don't want certain things looked at. I mean, the obvious I, did is... Did I say what I don't want looked at? I didn't say. I didn't tell you. I did. Precisely, and I'm suggesting the opposite of that, which is there's something that you definitely must look at, and that is the difference in the in the uh, in the locale and the terrain and the geography of California. When you go to a vehicle miles traveled methodology, for my constituents, uh, we're going to have a greatly different impact than you would have in urban San Francisco or urban Los I Angeles. Agree. And I would request, and I would put and if anyone these would kinds like to of travel questions. with me from Bakersfield to Barstow to Needles and Death Valley and up to Bishop and Big Bear, and I mean, in that compressed geography of California, uh, vehicle miles become very, very sensitive if we move to a methodology based on that. So that's why. I suggest that that must be looked at. And I would, I would, as I said, I would encourage members to ask those kinds of questions while I didn't, and I would be glad to include that as the bill moves forward, that one size may not fit all. How are they going to deal with different topographies, different geographic areas? If we did move in this direction, what would those impacts right. be? And Precisely. I would be willing to, I think that's a very important question that we should I'm be I'm taller asking. than you, and so, for example, there's a difference there that we have to compensate for. You are a giant in this legislature. Okay, enough of that. Thank you. Let me, <laughs> so I'm, I, I think... I take that as my close. The, uh, the variable nature that Senator Ashburn is requesting, actually might prove that people that live in his district want to travel to the mountains and, you know, take on the more difficult terrain than just the common flat stuff all the time. But we'll let the study determine that. Any other questions or comments? All right, then. And you have closed. Is there a motion? Motion by Senator Orpeza. Please call the roll. <coughs> Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, I have. Aye. Huff, aye. Ashburn? No. Ashburn, no. DeSonye? Aye. DeSonye, aye. Harmon? Kehoe? Aye. Kehoe, aye. Orpeza? Orpeza, aye. Pavley? Simidian? 5-1. Let's keep that bill on call yeah, for five the absent one, We will keep Thank it you. open for those not here. <laughs> Senator Alquist, would you like to present your bill now? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Today, over 21,000 Californians wait for organ transplants. One third of those on the waiting list will die before they receive the organ they need. That is 7,000 Californians who will die on the waiting list. Of the 21,000 who need an organ transplant, 17,000 need a kidney. I'm trying to address this issue with SB 1395, which does three basic things. Number one, it will require an applicant for a driver's license to either check that he, she would like to register as a donor or check that he, she does not want to register at this time. This question, this requires applicants to think about the choice rather than skipping over the question. 34 other states already require this to happen and when they created the legislation, they started from the point of having both boxes. Only nine states, including California, have clerks that play a passive role. So that's the first thing that it does. It does two other things. The bill establishes the first in the nation statewide registry for live kidney donors to be administered, which could be expanded later for other organ donations. This will establish a mechanism for donors and recipients to be matched statewide rather than through informal hospital-to-hospital -hospital exchanges that currently exist. The final piece is that the bill would require the DMV to provide Donate Life with quarterly updates on the monetary donations received. Currently, an applicant may also designate a voluntary contribution of $2 to support organ and tissue donation. DMV collects these contributions from which it deducts 
uh, actual administrative costs of signing up donors, and then DMV transmits the remainder to support the work of Donate Life California. This bill requires, uh, requires uh, approval by the legislature, annual reports to the legislature for four years, requires uh, quarterly reports to Donate Life, which will allow a better outreach and education plans. SB 1395 requires that the DMV provide information on the back of the application form that will, that will direct individuals to the Donate Life website if a person requires more information, including how to remove his or her name from the registry. Um, I understand that the committee has some concern about wait times, and I have a witness from the DMV who can address this issue. So I have two witnesses. Uh, Dennis Clare from DMV and Brian Stewart from Donate Life. And in closing, I would just say that given that there are 21,000 California, Californians who need organ transplants and of those 17,000 who need a kidney, this bill moves California forward in helping Californians focus on the importance of organ donation and in reducing the needless deaths of Californians waiting to receive a needed organ. I ask for your I vote. Witness. Witnesses in support. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having us here today. Certainly. My name is Brian Stewart. I'm president of Donate Life California. We are a state authorized program with a history of successful partnerships with the state and state agencies and a record of achieving our life saving mission cost effectively. The state asks of every resident of driving age to register as a donor. And thanks to our partnership with the DMV, 6.4 million Californians have enrolled in the Donate Life California registry. Since 2005, more than 1,000 lives have been saved and many tens of thousands healed by California residents who registered as organ and tissue donors prior to death. While lives are being saved, we continue to face an ongoing need for life-saving transplants, especially kidney patients. The need is especially pronounced among African Americans and Latinos, which are communities ravaged by diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease. The average wait time for a kidney transplant is five years, and half of dialysis patients die within that time frame. In the face of this need, only 27% of DMV customers check yes to designate themselves as organ donors. That's up from 20% four years ago, but we can do much, much better. We're confident that the provisions of SB 1395 will help toward that goal. Because the current DMV form has a yes checkbox only, the DMV clerk is not authorized to ask if the customer meant to leave the question unanswered. Many DMV customers bypass the donor registry question because simply it is optional. SB 1395 would bring California in line with the vast majority of states by asking customers to check one of two boxes, yes, I wish to register, or I do not wish to register at this time. We are confident that many who were ignoring the optional yes only question, thus postponing their decision for another five years, will respond to the prompt by checking yes. If they check no, we will know there is a certainty of the intent not to be registered at this time. In addition, SB 1395 will offer Donate Life California tools to allow us to increase participation in organ donation programs with an annual report and quarterly updates detailing donor designation trends among key demographic groups. Saving lives is our mission, and SB 1395 offers more tools to help us be more effective in that pursuit. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Dennis Clear from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for not getting a letter into you on time acknowledging our support for this uh, important bill. The department believes since our partnership with Donate Life goes back three years, it's time to clarify what we've been doing procedurally. And like Mr. Stewart testified, some of the inconsistencies the customers have encountered is a result of probably the way we implemented our procedures. So at this time, we think this is a step forward because it will enable the customer to have that doubt removed on what they should indicate on the form. I do recognize, like the analysis pointed out, that we are experiencing right now some uh, unusual wait times. We believe, however, that that extension of wait time is now due primarily to the furloughs. Since we hope there are only going to be seven more furlough days, we believe that's a temporary predicament for the department, and since this is a long-term strategic change in what will happen with our partnership, we still believe this is a step in the right direction. I have, I'd like to ask some questions, sure. really. 
and, and I think it will reflect my, my feeling that on this bill is that I'm torn. I think that it is an admirable goal. I am a donor myself. I would like to see us elevate the number of donors. But I am really concerned with four million people approximately going to DMV, and now the clerk or the, the person is now going to have to explain to me, I go in, I don't know whether I want to be a donor or I don't. I just don't know. And so I le and right now, if I do choose to be, I, I have, uh, it's, it's voluntary, I can check that box. It may not be the most appropriate way, it's been, but it's still voluntary. Uh, and I'm one of those that voluntarily has, has checks, yes, I do want to be a donor. When you make it mandatory, and now I bring my DMV, and there's a long line, it's been 55 minutes, and you're thinking that it's going to cut down, and I'm really angry because I've been waiting for 55 minutes to do it, and now I turn it in and the clerk says, wait a second, you did not fill this out, this item, because now I'm required to, and I say, well, you mean to get a driver's license, I'm required to do it? And you say, yes, and I say, well, I don't know what it really means. Can you explain to me what, what obligation? Then why don't you step over there, let me do it, then come back, These read about this. Well, I still don't understand. So now there's kind of another loop that's going to develop. The question to you is, what are you really going to do to reduce that? Are we going to create a logistics nightmare? Because we are not going to get any better in, our, in, in terms of resources for DMV. Is it, are you saying it's acceptable for people to wait an hour to an hour and a half? Is that really what you're saying no, is sir. acceptable? No, then what, what are you planning to bring down that wait time when we're now asking DMV to do more? Well, in terms of the furloughs ending, we believe the wait times are going to be reduced because we'll be open the extended period of time. Our strategy to eliminate that confusion, particularly at that point in the customer transaction, is because these forms are not available online because of the motor voter and the, the nature of this form, they have to come to our office to get it. And they stand in the initial line when they first come to our offices. What we do with the other mandatory questions is we highlight on this form, while they go through our queuing system and get a number, we highlight which portions of this form are required and mandatory. And then we give them a brochure. So where, while they're waiting, and unfortunately people will have some minimal wait, that is when we will share with them the information that we hope will answer their question. And the other issue is today... What if it doesn't? Well, then our, our clerk is going to have to do a minimal amount of conversion, which you do today, sir, honestly, because right now, if they leave it blank, what we do is we indicate that, because uh, we, we have to key something into our system. That is then recorded as a, as a no because of the, the current requirement that we produce a report on all of the yeses. So what we'll do now is we'll indicate in the system uh, that it's a no, the same way we do today, but we'll have the form that shows an assertive answer. But it doesn't take the person any longer. They don't have to respond to a, a yes or a no. If they choose not to really want to deal with this, it just goes forward. I'm just really concerned, not because of the goal, and I'm not saying impose, I'm just mm -hmm. that we are going to make going to DMV even more of a headache than it already is today. And we know, I cannot tell you how many calls we're getting now in terms of the logistics about going to a DMV office. It's, it, this, it, it, California, as they say, is gone, and you're just saying it's the furlough, but it's even before the, we've gone from a little under 20 minute wait to almost an hour. That's what it's taking, and I just see this as adding to it, and it just makes me nervous. That's by, by doing this and putting more demands on DMV. Uh, so that's really okay. other witnesses in support. Chris Rosa. Chris Rosa representing the National Kidney Foundation in support. Oh, well, but you're really, and I think that we should just indicate, and I think that's a very important part of the bill, but much of the discussions about the live kidney donor, will this bill is also, will be going back to rules committee, that's the recommendation, to be sent to the health committee to deal with that issue primarily. So the issue that we've dealt with about the, uh, the changing the requirements for the donor, 
is really what is under the jurisdiction of this committee. The other aspects, uh, while it's certainly we have to be aware that we are voting on it, is really the issue that will be decided and talked about, I think, in the health committee. So that's, they're both in it, but that's not really our jurisdiction to make those decisions in this committee about the importance of that. Are there other witnesses in support? Senator Orpeza, Sen Sen do you want to? Fine. Are there any witnesses that are in opposition to this bill? Now, Senator Orpeza. I must begin by uh, making an observation, which is it is the rare State Department that comes before us and agrees to do something else within their scope of what they have responsibility for. It we should congratulate you. Thank you, Senator Orpeza. It is Orpeza. indeed the rare, and, so, and I want to commend you for that. I'm very supportive of this measure because I believe that it will not, I mean, I believe the experts <laughs> were sitting before us and saying it's not going to be an overly cumbersome uh, task uh, for the employees. Um, I recognize that this is a volatile time for many of our depar state departments, and DMV being one of the most, um, wh where the most members of the public have interaction with the state department. DMV is probably right up there toward the top of the list. Almost four million so, a year. Uh, recognizing that the furloughs have posed problems, recognizing as uh, that. The DMV has historically been a whipping boy for the lack, for the complaints of the public when they don't get service as quickly as they would like to. Um, I think some of that criticism has been fair. I think other of that criticism has been unfair. Um, and so, in recognition of the fact that this is a this is a valuable. Um, thing to do and that the department itself is stepping forward and saying yes we are willing to accept this task. I think that we ought to trust the experts on this and unless we have some other objections, which I certainly don't, uh, that we should move this bill forward. Um, I, I understand it's going back to rules. As a member of the Rules Committee, I. Uh, don't know what will happen to it from there, but I guess if it's going back, I'll see it again in that committee uh, to decide whether or not it needs further hearing. But as the bill stands today, I'm very comfortable as a member of the Transportation Committee supporting this measure. Senator, I'm wondering now, this is not, I'm just asking, Senator. Uh, right now what we're hearing is that we have a system in place where someone goes to the DMV and on the, the, the application for the driver's license, it just says, do you wish to be a, a donor? That's all it says. With a yes checkbox. Just with the X checkbox, and it's not required. If the, and what this says is it changes it to, a, to, a, to two things. It does a mandate that you must respond to this, which uh, now it's just voluntary, and it also has no, I do not wish to do that at this time. If we had the same thing, and you're saying, well, we don't know how many no's really are, or really people, is, is an intermediate step, and if, they, if we changed it to keeping it, yes, I wish to be a donor, and just adding a no box, no, I don't wish to do it at this time, and keeping that as a voluntary, and just seeing whether everybody fills, you know, whether that changes the number, or do you still wish to say yes to do that, but also make it mandatory? So the question really is, is there some intermediate for a year or two we could see whether in fact the there, whether we up the number of people that actually respond to it. Um, and I'm again, yeah. this is your choice, your call, whether to do this. Right. But that mm -hmm. seems to me what would be, if we were going to do an intermediate step, that that's what we would do. 
Well, if I could answer that question, Certainly, thank you for the that's question. What I'm asking. Um, right now, the clerk has to key in an answer into the field. It either goes in as a, a Y for they checked the yes box or an N for they did not check the yes box. But if we and had a no already there. That's true, but the thing is, is if the customer, the only impact on the clerk happens if someone willfully leaves both boxes unanswered, in which case it's pointed out that these but neither of these boxes is checked, please check one. So that is the thing is what we, we still need an answer to those questions so that the clerk knows what to key in to the field. So with a yes or an I don't wish to register at this time, those are the two options. We would need, the clerk would need certainty as to which answer the customer wanted to make. So I appreciate the search for middle ground, but it sounds like ultimately what we're looking for is a definitive answer from the customer on what they want marked in that field, as opposed to what's keyed in either intentionally as a yes or maybe unintentionally as not checked. So we're just looking to, to get that certainty because this is that important a decision. Senator Kehoe. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Alquist, uh, this is uh, about registering in person at the DMV office and the, um, the chairman's concerns about the wait time I share. Mm -hmm. And it's just, um, it's just appalling, the level of service that we're allowing to constantly degrade. Um, anyway. The furloughs are a big problem, but there are um, staffing problems and IT problems and just space problems, very old offices that uh, continue to keep Californians waiting in line far too long. Is there any difference in the in-person application versus a mail application, uh, U.S. mail application under the bill? Do you want to say that? Um, under the bill, I don't believe that's specifically um, addressed because we're focusing on the form. Uh, but I think what we would look at would be to uh, amend the mail-in form so that there would be a yes or the I don't wish to register at this time, again, so that we had the certainty and it wasn't a matter of it being ignored. So uh, does we, the bill do that? When? At this time, it at, doesn't. But at not, not at this time. Okay, so it's just the, the walk-in. Right. just the walk-in. At this time, time. yes. I, I, I know you're uh, wanting to do a good job, and the intention is very good, but the I feel a little bad for the people who have to go to the office. I think these are the least sophisticated customers, the people that are not calling ahead for appointments or not, um, or probably doing it by mail. Probably, and there may be, and it's totally anecdotal, I have no idea, that the walk-in traffic probably uh, may have more uh, 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 language problems, pe people who are speaking other languages as their, other than English uh, as their primary language. And I do think it's going to add to time. There is no such thing I, as a quick answer at the DMV necessarily, or certainly not a guaranteed quick answer at the DMV. There's a lot of room for misunderstanding and where do I go and do I have to go to the back of the line? And, and I just, yeah. there seems to be sort of a double standard here in, in uh, a, a sense. And I just, I, I think uh, I'd like to hear a little more. It, it's a good intention to try to up the numbers of people who will uh, check the yes box. But it, I also feel like it's a little bit of arm twisting, not intentional arm twisting, but just as a result of having to, to answer the question before getting the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, license or identification card. How can you make it, um, what's your intention about, it, or is it your intention to have the walk-in traffic treated differently than the, than my, the my, what, register my, by mail? My in intention is to save lives and to have more people donate organs and to make that just a focus. Um, the bill is sponsored by the governor and um, also strongly supported by Donate Life. And originally it had been suggested to me that we do an opt out where everybody becomes an organ donor unless you check the box saying you're not. And I said no to that. Thank you. Yes. Because <laughs> um, we're talking about free will is what we're talking about. And what we're talking about on this forum is just 
having s someone from the DV DMV say to you, you know, please fill in this box. Either yes, I want to be an organ donor, or no, not at this time. There's no penalty. There are no penalties associated with this bill. Except that you have to fill out the box. Mr. Chairman, I support the bill, but the discussion that we've just had causes me concern about equal application of the laws. If I am uh, uh, executing my license renewal at home in the mail, uh, then this isn't this isn't something that I deal with. We should ask DMV. Well, and that's the question I'm asked. I think the, the testimony was it does not deal, this same check the box requirement would not apply to those who do their business through the mail at home. And if I may interject, Senator Ashburn, I agree with you. I mean, uh, so how, I mean uh, we would, have to reconcile I would like to this. see that everyone's treated equally right. and that the forms that come to your home yeah. mm -hmm. also have, you know, please... Check one of these or two the boxes. email or the email or whatever Online. it is. Well, mm -hmm. please check one of these so, two so boxes. So the question, Mr. Chairman, is this for DMV: um, if, if if we make, I mean, the law must apply equally to those who appear in person or those who accomplish their business at home through the mail. If, if I don't check the boxes and I do it through the mail, is that now not a huge burden on the DMV to now follow up on my? application, contact me in some way, you can't process it because I didn't check a box, I don't have a clerk standing there, how are you going to deal with that? Uh, Mr. Ashman, that's a very good point. And we actually read the bill because it refers to an original and a renewal application and it doesn't distinguish between the methods that you renew. So currently what we do is when we offer someone a chance to renew by mail or online, which are your two options depending upon your driving record, we send you the form with the check boxes for both the donation, the donation, the voluntary donation and the organ registry. And so when you do it online, we can make the two boxes a mandatory item. Where you, you have to check one or the other. We are looking at the, the dilemma of having a form returned through the mail in our system that does not have one of the boxes checked and whether that would cause a, a rejection in our system. And that's something that we are considering how we would resolve that. Because it is a dilemma. And, because so, if it's, uh, and unresolved, you have unequal application of the law, which is problematic. Yes. Right. But we actually have the situation currently with the renewal process because you have to reply to the medical questions. So we already, ha we already handle a series of renewal exceptions when people do not indicate on their renewal application to those five medical questions because those are mandatory questions on the renewal. So this only really adds... So do you send that back? We contact the individual. Yes, because we have to have your signature on there that you have answered that you do not have an, an outstanding medical condition. So the way we're revising this form is we would essentially add the registry question to the kind of the medical section so people kind of associate them with those mandatory questions because we believe there is a connection to the driving um, privilege. Thank you. Senator Huff and then Senator DeSalnier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I think the objective is that we want to have more people volunteer to uh, be donors. Uh, I share some of the concerns that the chairman has said in um, Ms. Keogh also about the wait times. And, you know, usually when people go into DMV, they, they just, I mean, they're carving time out of their workday, whatever it is, they got other things to do. And I think adding one more mandate to them that could get them sidelined. I mean, are we then going into the counseling business to, you know, when they got questions on this? And they're serious questions. I, I don't think that just because somebody doesn't check it means that they haven't thoughtfully considered it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a soft no. You know, they don't, it seems cruel to say no. Mm -hmm. So you just make a decision by not making a decision. But it's still a decision. And so uh, maybe there's another approach we can do that doesn't 
impact them on wait times, that encourages them to do this. I mean, why couldn't we in our study booklets put something in there about the importance of donating organs and that there's an opportunity for them to do so on their application? And then on every application, we already have that, but even on the test that they have to take, you could have in there an informational thing at the bottom. You have the right to donate, you know, become a donor. And so then go ahead and do what the chairman said in, you know, have your yes box, your no box. But if they don't choose to do either one of those, score it as a no. And that gives them a couple more alternatives to corral them into the decision you would like them to do. But it's still a volunteer program, but we're sitting here trying to make a mandate out of them to jump through some hoops they may or may not be ready or willing to do. So that would be my suggestion. I, I can't support the bill the way it is today. Senator DeSaulnier. Uh, I, I think we're all struggling with this, and I think all of us, as someone said, we don't want to micromanage the DMV. Um, but it strikes me that either either what the chairman has suggested, and, and I do, the struggle is that we want to get more donors. So I'm inclined to say I will vote for it, but I'd like you to keep working on this. I'm inclined to, and I still you know, reserve the right that if it doesn't come back when it gets to the floor. But if, if you're doing it online, you're not going to be able to do it because the computer will just automatically tell you you haven't cleared the field. What if you just did a pilot project and see how that worked? And I would think that just intuitively, that kind of demographic are the people who are going to be more inclined to do it. And then if that works, we could take it to scale to the other things. I mean, have you thought of doing that? I, I think the challenge with a pilot project is just that the DMV is one very large organization. And so in terms but of... if you did it for every application that was done online, is what I'm saying. Oh, just because online and start easy. out online. We're all used to that now that you get the Bronx chair, you can't go any further until you read it and come back. Right. But it does seem very problematic, as Senator Ashburn said. Mm -hmm. You do it by mail, you've got to send it back. Understanding that you do that already, but this I'd be inclined to think more people would miss because it's new. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're struggling for all of here is to let you go ahead, but to do some kind of um, wisdom of Solomon. So just a suggestion. Sure. And would that work? I think it's a, a good suggestion. Um, obviously, the implementation cost would be low. I think also, uh, Senator Huff, your suggestion about uh, having uh, very clear language uh, that there it is a defaulting to no uh, if it remains unchecked. Um, will everyone read the fine print? I don't know, but you would have the equal, equal application of the law in all okay. in Enrollment channels. I think that sounds like a reasonable compromise. And how much? What percentage of all the applicants would that capture? Do you think? Pardon me. The question. If you, how many people would we capture as a percentage of people renewing? Well, right now we started out at 20 percent. We're up to 27 percent uh, at this time. Uh, where it can go, we think it can go northward of 30, perhaps 35 percent, um, if we can capture people that are skipping it routinely. Because at the field office, like like Mr. Clear was saying, you know, they're presented with the application with the required questions highlighted, and so when a question isn't highlighted uh, for a large number of people, they'll just presume, well, I don't need to answer anything else. So I think there's a large number of people that are just flat out ignoring the question or not even recognizing it exists because it's not highlighted. So I think by making this a question that is highlighted where we're asking or requiring a question to be answered uh, with the default of, you know, if this is unchecked, will be considered a no. Um, I think at least it will prompt people to consider the question, you know, actively consider it and we're asking for their intentional answer. I think that would be a good amendment, Mr. Chairman. So let's just say ask if, you know. Any other? I think we've had a full discussion of it. And I think, I think that I would, Mr. Chairman, so right now the bill as it stands is for in-person applications no. or renewal only? All, all, all. I think. We're talking okay. about all. All people Maybe treated it equally, okay. it's for all. But all. in person. Is that an amendment or is that what's in there now? No, no, we're going to amend the bill, obviously. I, I, I think what we're saying is right now what has happened is independent of this bill, DMV has realized that the what has been on the in-person application by just having just the yes box may not be the most appropriate. And on their email, they've already put in a no box. And so we're not getting the same. So whether this bill passes or not, DMV is modifying and there will be a no box. The question really is to us is, should it be mandatory or are there other ways of reaching that? Uh, and what happens 
how is DMV going to deal with the fact that now they're going to have to counsel people or talk to people about what it means for them, and which I don't think would bother us. Any of this is not the, 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 the actual policy. If, in fact, we did not have a crisis in terms of people waiting from 20 minutes now in 2007 to now 55 minutes in 2010. And we're going to add to that time, let's be honest. Because, and it, it just, we're all torn. How do we make this, how do we meet these conflicting goals? And it's not, Senator, that we're not struggling. We're just not yeah. sure. How do we reconcile these these worthwhile goals? And we want to see people do it, but we also know that we have an agency, as a state, other organization, that has not been adequately supported, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be adequately supported. And we're going to have longer times, and we have to deal with that issue also, because how, as we implement it. So I. There are a lot of things that are still up in the air. I don't know. Senator Desaulnier had asked you to take as you know as a, as an alternative. As a, and so, where are you now, listening? Okay, to that? I've also been consulting with Donate Life and with the governor's office since the governor is the sponsor. And if I understand what I'm hearing, number one, whatever we are we are going to do, we are going to do for everyone who's applying for a driver's license, right. whether it's in person, by mail, uh, or. Right. Uh, over and, the, and you were caught in internet. the fact that right now DMV is not doing, they have intended right. to do it the same for everybody, but they have already changed right. independent of this yeah, bill. So that's the first piece. Right. The second piece is that there will be two boxes. The two boxes will still say yes or no, I do not wish to donate at this time. Uh, that the DMV person will say, uh, please fill in the boxes. But if the person... It leaves the box, both bo boxes blank, then that defaults to meaning, no, I don't want to do it. So they will not be required. If they choose not to do it, and then they, the, the DMV right. says, do you want to do that? And they say, right. I'm just not willing to do yeah. that. Yeah, and there's no penalty. They don't have to, but the, but the DMV person, to bring it to their attention, will say, uh, we would appreciate it if you would fill in one box or the other. And then if the person says, I don't want to fill in either one, the DMV person would say, Fine, and there are no penalties. And they get their license. And they get their license. I'm not sure how eloquent it, this is and how it would work, but I think you're taking moving us in the right direction. I'm trying to hear. You're, hear you're you trying, all. Senator, and we are very appreciative. You are moving us, <laughs> and with that, I would say that if the bill does get out, I would reserve the right to bring it back because it is not. Totally cooked. These are, and I and I applaud you for saying we're going to have a mandatory that's almost mandatory, but it's not really mandatory, and I'm not sure we can pull this off, and it's well, not clear yet. I, I think we can pull. But it I off. think I I'd be willing to give you a shot, but I'm going to tell you we're going to bring this back, but to committee. But I think you're moving, trying to deal with the issue that. DMV doesn't have to then go through. If a person doesn't want to do it, DMV doesn't have to spend a whole lot. Of, they're just going to assume it's a no. They don't have to spend a lot of time telling you've got to do it. You've got to keep reading. You've got. It will allow us to at least begin to address the fact that we're all so concerned about is that people. One of the reasons people hate us is that the face of state government is DMV, let's be honest. And they just know that it means unbelievable weight. Yes. For the, the record, state, DMV it? grimaced when you said that. Did I say? No. No. Let's go. Well, in this one, I don't want to go. What happens is if they've said yes on record, and now they leave it blank. Then go yeah, when the amendments it will have to be adopted when the bill gets to the health committee or prior to going what, to the hear you. We're not going to ask you to take the amendments now. There, we might have a scheduling problem in terms of this has been double referred. So well, we have... Will it will be double referred. So what we're saying is that as the bill, we would like you to take these amendments in the next committee, wherever that, that is. I, I promise. And we'll see how, as we see the language,
percentage of them if this bill yeah. moves forward. And they will be and basically will, exactly what I said. I okay. mean, the language will sound a little better than my... But it, what you're saying so, is folksy language, while but. people are expected to fill it out, they, if they choose not to fill it out, they will not, it will, their, their application will not be kicked back. Okay. May I close briefly? Any other questions? I'd just be happy to move that as you intend to amend it. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> very right much, Senator Huff. Uh, in, in closing, I, I, I just want to say three or four things. One, you know, with the 21,000 people on the waiting list and knowing that a third of those 7,000 will die before they get a, an organ, we have to figure out a better way. And that there are 34 states who from the get-go put in language giving applicants a choice of yes or no, not at this time. I want to thank uh, the governor for his leadership in sponsoring this, uh, for Donate Life, for their huge work, for the DMV, for um, understanding the issue and wanting to work with us. And I would also like to thank Steve Jobs, who um, we did a press conference on this bill at Stanford Children's Hospital with the governor, Steve Jobs, and myself, uh, Donate Life, and three or four others. And Steve made a point of saying, that uh, when he needed an organ, he put his name on the list in California, and it became very clear that he would have to wait five or six or seven years, that he would probably die before he got the organ, and that he needed to go to a different state where uh, the laws made it a little easier f to bring it to people's attention that donating was a good thing and had a procedure in place to do that. And Steve went to Tennessee and waited some time there, but within six or eight months we received the, do the uh, donation. And I remember him saying that for about 35 days, every day he woke up not knowing if he would make it to the next day, if he would live to the next day. And so what I'm really thinking when I think of the 7,000 people who aren't going to make it unless we do something differently, I do believe that we can come together to figure out a way that is respectful of all of us, of all human life, uh, to accomplish this goal, and I ask for your I vote. Will the, secre will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal. Aye. Lowenthal, I have. Aye. Huff, I, Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn, I, DeSonier. Aye. DeSonier, I, Harmon. Kehoe. Aye. Kehoe, I, Oropesa. Aye. Oropesa, I, Pavley. Semidian. Semidian, I. Seven, zero. Bill has sufficient votes for passage, but we're going to place it on call for the absent members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dutton is waiting. Senator Dutton, SB 1295. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee, I have a bill here which I believe should probably be a, coming under the uh, definition of pretty much just a common sense and no-brainer, actually. <laughs> uh, and also, I'd like to start off by saying there are some uh, amendments that was recommended by the committee, staff re uh, recommendations. Uh, I will be taking those. Uh, and um, with that, this bill, basically, uh, what it does, it'll allow family members of Purple Heart and Legion of Valor veterans to keep their special license plates after, uh, after the... Uh, veteran uh, and their spouse had passed away. Existing law already allows this for Medal of Honor and prisoner of war veterans. Uh, this would just be consistent with that. I think all of us would agree these are small tokens uh, of our appreciation for the service uh, California veterans have, and it, it, especially when they've been awarded our nation's highest honors. Uh, the amendments I basically have introduced uh, will eliminate the requirement, uh, some of the uh, filing requirement necessary. The form. And the affidavit, I believe. The affidavit, yeah. That's right. And it was recommended, and I thought, frankly, it kind of fits in the types of things we're doing right now. I, it seemed to, to us also. It's very consistent with what you want to do, and so we'll accept that as an author's amendment. Uh, I have with me uh, Stanford Ross here today. Uh, he's with the California Order of the Purple Heart, and uh, would like to make a comment. Witnesses in support. 
Uh, excuse me, that, that is not on. Okay. Now it is. Okay. My name is Sanford Ross. I'm the legislative liaison for the military order of Purple Heart, Department of California. Uh, I'm closely uh, going over the bill and everything. I think this would be a, a good thing for the family, the children, to be able to keep as an archive for the brave veteran that were wounded. And also, you remember the Purple Heart is given to the ones that gave the ultimate sacrifice. And any vote from y'all uh, on this committee would be highly appreciated from the military or the Purple Heart of having this done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Good afternoon. Dana Nicole, Pete Conatine Associates, uh, representing the American Legion. Uh, the American Legion Department of California advocating on behalf of California's two million veterans is in support of Senator Dutton's bill. The uh, Legion of Valor decorations are awarded for extraordinary heroism. The various service medals comprising the Legion of Valor are second only to this country's highest military decoration, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Many of these medals are awarded posthumously. The Purple Heart is given for wounds sustained in combat, and mementos of these honors are worthy of passing on to the recipient's families. Ask for your support. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? The bill's been moved by Senator Ashburn. I think Senator... We can recommend. Oh, we had some amendments we wanted to take. To I think there are amendments the, uh, that he's just taken about actually making it work much better absolutely. in terms of removing the affidavit, and that's the reason. Yes. So the bill, and, and we can also, recommend as the bill moves forward, to be honest. I would point sense. out, though, that if, uh, if any of the members would like to sign on as co-authors, we could do it at this time, because we are amending this bill. Senator Ashburn will sign on as co-author. The chair would like to, and the chair would like to sign on. Okay. And let's just keep. And Senator Kehoe would like to sign on as a co-author, and Senator Desaulnier would like to sign on. <laughs> and I think that reflects the the importance of the bill, and I do too. and uh, uh, it it's it, it is a it is something that the families should be able to keep, and it's and it's it really is a very very important step, and so I'm glad to support the bill, Senator. And with that, would you like to close? Yeah, and I think that right now there's simply an I vote, but I think you know this is one of those opportunities we have to really truly just put the politics aside. This is not a political thing, and. I think that's rep representative, uh, you know, with regards to the committee and everybody's desire to want to come on board as a co-author. So, with that, I'd request an item. SB 1295, as amended in committee, will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal, aye. Lowenthal, aye. Huff, Ashburn, aye. Ashburn, aye. Desonier, aye. Desonier, aye. Harmon, Kehoe, aye. Kehoe, aye. Oropesa, aye. Oropesa, aye. Pavley, Simidian. Submitting I six zero. Bill has six votes. We're going to hold the place it on call to keep it uh, for the absent members. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Dutton. Thank you. Is Senator Leno here? Is no, Senator Leno here? Is not here. Senator Desaulnier. We have two bills. Shall we begin with SB 965? We will begin wherever you would like, Mr. I Chair. I would like to begin with okay. SB 965, item number one, high-speed rail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, SB 965 is uh, for the High-Speed Rail Authority. As you all know, the federal government, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, granted California and the High-Speed Rail Authority $2.25 billion. This uh, legislation is a vehicle to allow us to spend that money in the most appropriate and uh, um, quick way is what I'm trying to work for to get many of these jobs out into the California economy. It can create this bill and these monies can create up to 600,000 construction jobs and an additional 450,000 jobs as they relate uh, to those 600,000. An important part of this bill requires more uh, oversight for the high-speed rail authority. Uh, the bill requires that uh, a report to the legislature within 60 days of entering into the required cooperative ag agreement with the Federal Railroad Administration for the expenditure of funds. And then secondarily, this bill also incorporates language, a recommendation by the LAO to require an annual progress report from the High Speed Rail Authority to the legislature. Uh, with that, I would ask for your aye vote and turn it over to witnesses. Or I, Actually, we have supporters here. Witnesses in support. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, Jose Mejia, California State Council of Labor's in support of the measure. Uh, it's probably no news to you or any of the members on the committee that we are currently experiencing a high number of unemployment and any effort possible, any effort made Here. that would expedite projects to get them going, put people back to work, stimulate the economy would be a big plus. So I stand before you to urge that you consider the measure and urge your I vote. It's certainly the right way to go. Uh, I know we're very excited about what's going on with the Trans Bay Hub in San Francisco, and there's language related to that particular situation there as well. So once again, I urge for your I vote. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Member Cesar Diaz, on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, we also stand in, in strong support of this legislation. It deals with a lot of unemployment issues in the Building Trades Council uh, and members, and also provides the accountability and, and the requirements under the federal stimulus dollars. Uh, we received a, the biggest portion of those federal stimulus dollars for high-speed rail, and this helps us get that money on the street and get our members back to work. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Paul Bauer on behalf of the Trans Bay Joint Powers Authority. Uh, we are in support of the legislation and appreciate the author's willingness to work with us going forward and would urge your support for the legislation today. Thank you. We have other questions from members. Uh, uh, well, first, are there any witnesses in opposition? Uh, well, let's bring it back to members. I think that while I think that, yes, there is. Senator uh, Steve Schneid, on behalf of the High Speed Rail Authority, we're not not opposed. Uh, the authority has been monitoring this bill, and I think this the authority would subscribe fully to its goals of expedited construction, uh, job creation, efficient use of funds, and such. I think the amendments move the bill forward in a in a good direction, especially acknowledging that a cooperative agreement has to be signed with the federal government. This is a, a support. Uh, the the authority has not seen this version of the bill, so I'm trying to provide you with technical observations on this today, without giving you a position. If I can nuance that. I, I, th these amendments are, are welcome because they acknowledge the fact that the federal government has yet to tell the authority exactly what the conditions and terms of that award is. Uh, the authority is waiting anxiously to negotiate that cooperative agreement. This bill accommodates that process. and. Uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but uh, we look forward to working with the author on this. Uh, if something pops up in those federal discussions and negotiations, we certainly would want to uh, work with the author to make sure that this bill and, and those conditions worked well together. Senator, I'd like to compliment you. I think that um, while the jobs part of the bill is extremely important in your indication of how many jobs will be the, uh, developed as a result of the high-speed rail authority moving forward. I think, the, to me, the strength of the bill, and we've had a history with the high-speed rail authority making sure that we get our arms in the legislature around exactly what their business plan is, what their financial status is, how they will be expending money. Uh, we feel that this is a step in the right direction by putting this in, that federal ARA funds would have to go through an expenditure plan, and that that money and that plan is sent to both the, the policy committees, the legislature, and also to the budget committee. Uh, I think it will only help us in, as, the, as the legislature makes its uh, recommendations in terms of actual expenditures, that by building in this accountability, we will have the data before <coughs> us to make knowledgeable uh, uh, decisions. So I, I compliment you for putting that into the bill also. With Thank that, you, sure. uh, is there a motion on the bill? Bill's been moved by Senator Oropesa. Would you like to close, Senator? I respectfully ask for your I vote, and thank you for your staff and for you, Mr. Chairman, working with us to support high-speed rail. Absolutely. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal. Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Huff. Aye. Huff, aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn, aye. DeSonye. Aye. DeSonye, aye. Harmon. Kehoe. Oropesa. Aye. Oropesa, aye. Pavley. Simidian. Aye. Submitting an aye, six zero. Bill has six votes, sufficient for passage. We're going to place the bill on call uh, and in respect of the absent members.
Next, Senator, I believe you have one other bill. I do. Would First, let like me say it's it? always hard to distinguish Senator Huff from Senator Ashburn. Um, and no more than today. SB 1128, very different from the preceding bill. This is a district bill. Um, I'd ask my sponsors to come forward. Uh, this is a district bill for a very successful, popular senior community in the 7th Senate District, um, our Senate District. It's Rossmore, which is in the city of Walnut Creek. This bill merely clarifies and makes sure that we can continue to do something that the Rossmore has done for some time, 40 years, since 1970. They have uh, required a transfer fee that has allowed for lower monthly dues um, for the maintenance and for many of the amenities that people, 10,000 people who live in this community enjoy. Um, there is no opposition to this, and I would turn it over to our sponsors from Rossmore. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ronald Moschel. I am one of nearly 10,000 residents of the self-governed senior community, Rossmore Walnut Creek. I am currently president of the Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek, the trustee organization responsible for caring for the community facilities and other community infrastructure in Rossmore. I am very grateful to the committee and Senator DeSalnier for the opportunity to be here today to speak in favor of Senate Bill 1128 on behalf of the Golden Rain Foundation. The membership transfer fee has allowed the Golden Rain Foundation to preserve and enhance the facilities and the quality of life for the seniors in our community without having to increase the monthly dues. I can say without reservation that it would be devastating to our community and patently unfair to our seniors, including myself, who have already paid a fee if the membership transfer fee were to be compromised. My board and my community stand behind me when I ask you to please support Senate Bill 1128. It is fair and it is right. I thank you again for your time and will gladly answer any questions members of the committee may have. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Senator Lowenthal. Senator Lowenthal, members of the committee, I'm Sandra Bonato. I'm here to represent the Golden Rain Foundation um, of Rossmore and uh, to answer any technical questions you might have about uh, the bill. Thank you. Are there other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Uh, members of the committee, anybody wish to? Move the bill. Bill's been moved by Senator Kehoe. I'd just like to say that although it is just deals you with, as you said when you began, a district bill, it also impacts Southern California. I believe that there are three Rossmore and one, I know Senator Oropesa and I, uh, are right up on the edge of Seal Beach, Rossmore, which is Senator Harmon's district, who's not here at this moment. So this would also impact them. I just have one question, yes. just for my own, and I think I know the answer, but I want to be clear. Most, the vast majority of common interest development uh, deal with uh, the services and some through a, an assess a monthly assessment fee that you Rossmore and I think the uh, Golden Rain Foundation does not have a monthly assessment is that true and it's really the the transfer fee that that is used to provide or is there also a monthly assessment Senator, there, oh, go ahead go ahead yeah. please uh, there is Senator uh, we have a somewhat unique arrangement in Rossmore. We have the Golden Rain Foundation, which I represent, that is sort of like the umbrella organization for the community and is responsible for all of the streets and roads, infrastructure, recreation facilities, et cetera. For the residential part of, Ro of Rossmore, we have 17 homeowners associations who take care 
of the residents so far as their residential units are concerned. So we actually have both operations so you have both in the operations community. Going yes, sir. On. And what you're saying is, if you did not have the transfer fee, the impact upon the residents by having to up the amount that they would have to pay in, in terms of assessment, especially those residents, you know, that have been there for quite a while, that it would be. Uh, quite an impact upon there. That is correct, sir. And because of court decision, it's really important that we go through this process of enabling and legally enabling the Golden Rain uh, Foundation to be able to collect this transfer fee. Yes, sir. The bill has been moved by uh, Senator Kehoe. Uh, Senator, would you like to close? I would ask for your eye vote. Will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Huff. Aye. Huff, aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn, aye. Desonier. Aye. Desonier, aye. Harmon. Kehoe. Aye. Kehoe, aye. Oropesa. I always do. Oropesa, aye. Pavley. Semidian? Six, zero. Bill has six votes sufficient for passage, but we're going to hold the roll open, place that bill on call, and hold the roll open for the absent member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. Senator Leno's right here. Senator Leno, welcome. Your timing is impeccable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One tries. And you deliver. <laughs> Thank you. So this is an issue with which this committee has familiarity. Oh, yes. I've been here before. We call this an ongoing issue. <laughs> so the issue of the proliferation of illegal outdoor advertising, uh, the committee was very supportive of a proposal I brought forward last year, which uh, did not move forward after a hearing in judiciary. So we have retooled and are back again. But just to briefly make the case, uh, we know that this is well documented. Many news reports as a result of it. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, the planning department did a survey and found that 45% of signs there to be out of compliance. If you can imagine, almost every other outdoor advertising is out of compliance. Uh, the city has only three inspectors investigating, so you can imagine they're completely overwhelmed. And the industry, of course, is well aware of the situation and uses it to their benefit. In Los Angeles, again, they have just a handful of sign inspectors for a city that is 468 square miles, 10 times the mileage, square mileage of San Francisco, and 10,000 outdoor advertising displays. And keep in mind that the building and safety codes specifically exist to protect the citizens from unsafe and unfair construction. So currently, the Business and Professions Code defines the term lawfully erected to include not only those signs which were lawfully erect, erected, but then also signs that may go out of compliance. I can give you an example. This has happened repeatedly in a number of urban areas where the permit is for a single-sided sign. It goes up, erected uh, lawfully, and then in the dark of night, a second side is put up. They get to double their profits, and that is still lawfully erected. Now, if someone were to identify it as being no longer in compliance, the law currently allows for them to take down the second side, and there's no penalty. And you know, it's not unlike I grab your purse, and if I get caught, I gotta give it back. Uh, and that's the way it is now. So what our bill does is uh, defines lawfully erected to include displays uh, that uh, current law, sorry, protects those sign owners that are illegally, as I've just described. So what we want to do is to limit that definition of lawfully erected and so that it must be in compliance with all state laws, local ordinances, and local building permit requirements. And then the second part of the bill is that the uh, bill provides for civil penalties and disgorgement of gross revenues of the owner of a display that is erected or altered in violation of the law. Pretty simple, very straightforward. We have removed any discussion 
of rebuttable presumption. presumption and left that aside altogether. So that was the most controversial issue when we got to judiciary. That had not bothered this committee. It's not before you today. Just dealing with what is lawfully erected and what is not, and then allowing for some <coughs> civil penalties when it is identified and confirmed that these advertisements are no longer in compliance. I, let me be clear. Yes. Just, uh, this bill is double referred. It will be going from this committee to judiciary. Uh, to judiciary. I think that while both committees certainly have jurisdiction over this, the, much of the focus of this committee will be on the, def, the change or the precision in the definition of lawfully erected. Well, we are also supporting the civil penalties and the disgorgement, but I think uh, much of that discussion and the issues will be taking place in judiciary. Those are really the jurisdictional issues that bring it to, so while we may think that they are or not fair, I think the fuller discussion of the, of the issue of disgorgement will occur in, in the Judiciary Committee. We really, and I think talking about the lawfully erected part, uh, you've, you have delineated what the changes are to a sign that really would lead to being, uh, cause the sign to become um, uh, unlawful, and I think you talked about the height, the orientation, the size, the, these kinds of changes, so you've done that. You've also said, I think, that they, that a sign that's brought into compliance with an existing law, I think one of the major things that you also talk about is that it must be maintained also, not just brought into compliance, because of frequently a number of times it's brought into compliance and then as soon as it's done, it's, it, it's then changed back again. And so you really put into that definition also the maintenance of it. And I also think that frequently local governments uh, while they, they, we identify historically uh, uh, the, the requirements, we frequently do not deal with building permits per se. And building permits, which are the ones that really set the conditions under which it assigned. So you've really included now that in terms of compliance, that, that signs must not only take deal with the local ordinance, but State also law, the local ordinance and, and building and, permits. Right, and, building and the permits. building permits. And I think that bringing the building permits in really clarifies what those, what was really asked of the, of the, of the person that put up the sign, what are the conditions, and I think that's a step forward. With that, witnesses in support. This is Ken Fong, who is with the Office of the City Attorney in Los Angeles. Uh, yes, th thank you. Uh, I had testified uh, last time this was here. Uh, I've been a senior uh, billboard litigator in the city, and I'm you also. May be re you may be coming back a number of years after this. Well, I, I, I this hope to full, be coming we'll as, keep you as many times as I have to come back. We'll I will keep be you here. Busy. I'm not saying I'm advocating it. I'm just saying <laughs> I've been here. We, I, we keep hearing. <laughs> so, anyway, I just I want to support this bill because you know being in the trenches for many years in the city of L.A. and I've talked to a lot of uh, city attorneys throughout the state uh, because we've been fighting the, the battle in the city of L.A. For, for a number of years. And the problem with uh, our own uh, city ordinances and with state legislation as I see it is that whenever you have any unclarity at all, whenever there's any wiggle room, then the billboard companies will take advantage of that. Uh, they'll litigate, uh, they'll, they'll extend the time that they can keep their signs up, and then at the end of the process, we often find that we don't have real teeth. So we need to have clarity in all of the statutes at our disposal for enforcement, and then at the end of the process, we need to have some real teeth because it sends a message to other companies, if they know that they're not going to easily get away with something like this, then they're going to obey the laws that are on the books. So we heartily support this bill. Thank you. Are there other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? I think you can come forward, all of the witnesses in opposition.
Mr. Here's Chairman. The full Employment Act. Welcome. <laughs> Members of the committee, my name is Jim Lyons and I'm with Third Channel Outdoor. I'm here today to express my or our opposition to SB 1470. A similar bill failed to pass out of the Senate Judiciary Committee last year, and the current version of the bill remains problematic and even more punitive to our industry. Once again, the major problem with the bill is that it raises serious constitutional issues, primarily the taking of private property and the requirement to pay just compensation. The notion that the failures of the bill expressed last go around have been resolved, we dispute in earnest. The bill attempts to circumvent well-established Fifth Amendment rights by attempting to re redefine an altered sign as not qualifying for just compensation. Could an altered sign, not as the one described today where a second face was added, but could an altered sign such as one that was added more efficient lighting be added, would that be, uh, would that be a concern? or changing a wood deck to a steel deck to make our employees safer. The state of California allows a sign operator to bring a sign into compliance, as do most local governments. This practice evolved from decades of experience between government and the sign industry. Since the size, height, and orientation of a sign may be disputed due to conflicting or missing permits or minor changes over the years and important acquisitions. Situations over time where the original permit history cannot be located. This is a hundred year old history, industry. In Sacramento, Foster and Kleiser, our founding company, began erecting legal signs some 85 years ago. As time has passed, cities have emerged throughout California and acknowledge that record keeping is at worst absent at times or problematic and open to challenge. So let me give you a real example that happened just last week for our company. We're working with the city to do a relocation agreement with the, which is encouraged by 5412 to remove existing signs in distressed neighborhoods and rebuild an existing sign from 1961. Now this is encouraged by the legislature and law so that cities can take away what we describe and what is described here today is some of these unwanted billboards. The city in their due diligence process could not find the original permit and questioned its legality. Fortunately, our internal review found the state permit, but we were not able to find the local permit. The city had no records. This is not unusual. Later, we uncovered the nearly 50-year-old permit in some old construction file at a storage facility. Considering the state of record keeping over some 85 years across the state, we seek clarification that a sign owner can bring into compliance the sign owner retains the right to bring into compliance. Next, can we all imagine if this change as proposed in SB 1470 was applied to all land use cases? Would it be the equivalent of a city telling a homeowner or a business that, the, that their attached deck is three inches over the permitted size? Could this not leave open the possibility that one's entire home or business not only has to be removed, but it must be removed without just compensation? The remedy has always been and should remain to bring something into compliance. Last, would this proposed change discourage good faith efforts by bona fide sign owners to correct a sign that may be slightly out of compliance rather than calling attention to the issue and risking losing one's personal property? We are here to work with the author. <clears throat> Importantly, we seek clarification that 5216.1 rebuttable presumption remains intact and clarification on civil penalties. We want to continue to work with the author and the judiciary staff to clarify legal issues on this bill as described. Two very important points, and we strongly encourage one, that you continue to work with the author, and you said that you want to do that, and I think that's very admirable. Second, the questions and the issues, the key issues that you want clarification, really have to do with the judiciary staff, and so we're not in a position in this committee except to acknowledge, not that they are real or not, but that that discussion will take place in the judiciary committee. Other witnesses in opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ryan Brooks with CBS Outdoor. CBS represents the largest outdoor company in Northern California. And I first want to, you know, uh, 
Senator Leno and I have known each other for almost 15, 16 years from our days of working together at City Hall, and I do, you know, re respect you know his opinion and his judgment. But I think he got some of the facts a little bit wrong. He mentioned today that the city of San Francisco uh, showed that 45 percent of the signs were out of compliance, and they uh, published a report. And actually, he is correct. That's what the report said. But what he failed to mention is that prior to 1983 in the city. They failed to keep accurate documents. In fact, during a deposition, the former director of planning of the city of San Francisco quoted that they literally threw away boxes of permits, threw them away because the city never required them to keep those types of records. And so what he is asking us to do is go back and say, that sign, you can't find a permit. You know, that sign must be illegal if it was you, something, another face was that or something else was changed to that sign. We think that is uh, not the best way to go. Uh, number two, this industry has grown by acquisition. We've actually reduced the total number of signs in the state of California just because of attrition. We've acquired signs that date back to the 1904-1905. What this uh, piece of legislation says is if a previous owner changed the sign by the height, the width, whatever happened, that sign is now subject to civil penalties of $2,500 a day. We think that's wrong. Also, let me give you a real-life example of my house. I live in San Francisco. Bought my house five years ago. The house is 100 years old. The previous owner, I believe, changed the kitchen or the bathroom or the deck. What this would say is your whole house has to come down, and you're subject to penalties because of what a previous owner did to the sign or to that building. That is, on its face, absolutely wrong. Number, number three. CBS Outdoor is very proud. We receive a 100% rating from OSHA for our safety standards. We constantly go up and make sure the catwalks are safe for our union employees to climb on. We also change the lights on our signs because we're now going to more efficient and environmentally friendly lights. What this says, if you don't have a permit to do that, it is wrong. And, and last point, we, you're looking at building permits. Cities across California have different rules and regulations. Not every city requires you to get a building permit or a planning permit or go through a conditional use process. Every single city is different. What this legislation attempts to do is to have a one-size-fits-all solution for cities in, in California that have different ordinances that were built at, or created at different times. It just doesn't work that way. It would be nice. And we believe in strong enforcement. You know, we're a publicly traded company. And once we have, it's supply and demand. The more illegal signs that are down, the happier our shareholders are. It is simple. But the attempt, the way, the process that this is uh, achieving is wrong. It just doesn't work. And not one city is alike. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. On just to, to some of uh, first, I stand by what, what the analysis says. I think some of your concerns have to do with existing law. We're not here to really talk about existing law. We're here to talk about Senator Leno's bill. Uh, and I think that when you say, say well, you bought a 100-year-old house, right. if you know then that it's not, it's a non-conforming, if it's, if it's an, and you then seek out a permit, uh, to fix it, there are no penalties, and so that's, we disagree with what you're saying. Uh, that's Other not way, how it works, though. You, you, buy, you. you buy a sign, and if the city gives you a notice of violation, you go to cure that sign. But if you purchase, you said you may get signs that you've purchased that you know that they were done before and that they may be out. You can then seek re remedy without waiting for the city to do it. You don't have to wait to be cited. No, no, if we do, the problem is there's no record keeping. The city of San Francisco is a great example. They threw away the records. But yet some, you, can get, you can receive a notice of violation, and then retroactively you would be fined $2,500 a day. We're more than happy as an industry to cure any violation that we ever see. But the way this or this legislation is written does not allow for that to happen. Thank you. Other witnesses and others. Mr. Opposition? Chairman, members of the committee, Phyllis Marshall with Manette Phelps and Phillips representing Regency Outdoor Advertising. The seminal issue for us in this piece of legislation is notice and opportunity to cure. Uh, I know that that's an issue that will be brought up in the Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee. Um, and I know that there have been some discussions with regard to the um, rebuttable presumption, but the issue for Regency is notice and opportunity to cure, and we certainly look forward to working with Senator Leno 
as this measure moves forward. So you have no problems with the other parts of the bill? We do have uh, problems with the other parts of the bill, but the big issue for Regency uh, that is kind of the overreaching issue is the notice and opportunity to cure um, a vested property right. Other witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, uh, members, Jim Cassidy with the California State Outdoor Advertising Association. Now, Clear Channel and CBS are two of our members. Phyllis represents Regency, who's not a member, but we have 14 or 15 other member companies that are primarily family-owned. They're still reviewing this bill. Um, their livelihoods of their families and their employees are based on their successes. So we're also opposed to the bill, and we'll work with uh, Senator Leno and his efforts. Uh, any other witnesses in opposition? Mr. Members of the Senator Ashburn. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the, the concern that I have is that uh, this is the same bill that has been heard in this two-year session, and it was rejected, and, and now it's back in violation of the rules of the House. No, it's a very different bill, Senator. It's well, a new number, and it's a different bill. I have, yeah, I have the journal for both bills. Uh, here is Senate Bill 690, and here is Senate Bill 1470, and you'll find that, with the exception of, of one or two words, they are identical. And under the, ha the, under the rules of the House, uh, if any member raises an objection to Joint Rule 54C, during the course of a hearing, uh, that shall cause the bill to be automatically referred to the Rules Committee. Uh, this is a violation of the rules of the House. This bill was heard. It was uh, not enacted during the first year of the two-year session. Uh, it may be a worthy discussion for next year, uh, but I believe that we must adhere to the rules of the House, and so I do raise that objection and ask that the bill be referred uh, to the Rules Committee. I can just say from, as, as the chair, uh, we also were understood that, that, that the bill had come, before, another bill had been introduced last year and gone through the process. But as was pointed out by the opposition, some of the critical concerns of last year's bill had to do with rebuttable presumption, and the bill focused on rebuttable presumption. So that's more than just a few words. That's all been eliminated in this bill. This bill really has nothing to do about the issue about rebuttable presumption, which was the core part of the last bill and the reason for the opposition. So in, it was in our opinion, after reading the, that it is quite a different bill with a different focus. And so uh, we, we think that the bill must be voted on its merits up or down this year, which is an entirely different focus than the last year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would agree. We've retooled this. It's a completely different approach. What, what the rule adopted by the Rules Committee says, that if any member uh, raises an objection based on Joint Rule 54C, which mm -hmm. I do raise, all further motions on the bill will not be in order and the bill be, will be returned to the Rules Committee. I'm just... Yeah. So whether it's... Or not, yeah, I, I would let suggest that we take a 10-minute recess and we ask Greg Schmidt to, to respond. I think that's a legitimate concern. No, I, I agree with that. And I think that's really what we're going to do, Senator. Of course. Well, obviously, there's a difference of opinion in terms of, but he, I think Senator Ashburn uh, is following the rules, and, and we will respect that. So this committee will have a 10-minute recess. Or I take it back, just a second. Uh, no, no, no. Let's do the naming resolute. Let's do the other business. Let's just recess from this issue. Let's put this off. But we do have other issues. Uh, one is a item number seven, which is the denim, and item number eight, amendments to the committee policies on measures. I'd like to bring those up right now while while we wait for Greg Schmidt to come. So the first thing is I'd like to do the consent calendar, which is SCR 85 Denim. 
The consent calendar has been moved. Will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal. Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Huff. Aye. Huff, aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn, aye. Desonye. Aye. Desonye, aye. Harmon. Kiho. Kiho, aye. Oropesa. Oropesa, aye. Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Semidian. 7-0. We have seven votes sufficient for passage. We're going to hold, hold the roll open for the absent members and place the consent calendar on call. Members, as you recall at our last meeting, hearing, Senator Oropesa asked that we take another look at our committee policy regarding highway naming resolutions. We have done so, and I am supportive now of adding two additional requirements uh, for this committee to hear such measures. One, that the honorees be deceased in terms of the naming, and two, that the named highway segment be, be no longer than five miles. We discussed, but I am not supportive of, a requirement that the honorees be deceased for a period of time. And the reason, although I think it's a legitimate issue to raise, it is that many of the resolutions that we hear are for uh, peace officers who were killed in their, in their line of duty. And I think it's appropriate for us to honor them shortly after the event as the community wishes to honor them. And I think a cooling off period becomes arbitrary and presents logistical issues. And because of the nature of the kinds of uh, of naming resolutions that we get, I do not think it's appropriate now to put that in in terms of the committee amendments. So with that, I'd like to propose these two amendments for the committee to, and I would ask for, uh, well, to, someone to support or uh, an emotion to support these two amendments. I just have a question. S Senator Pavley? Uh, just since, we're, since we'll be moving to a more transit-oriented Yes. Yeah, um, well, names on highways, we're not building as many as highways, but names on highways stay there forever? No, no I think they, yes, they do. Yes, they do. So I've been back for informed by my staff that a name on a highway stays forever. I thought it was just 10 years. I thought it was just a limited it's period. There until rescinded. The name actually it may be removed when they do new signing, but the name actually stay is is there until it's rescinded by in statute. Yes. yes. That's right. That it requires legislative action. Senator Oropesa. Mr. Chair, I just want to thank you for your consideration on this issue and for the recommendations. I think they're good improvements, and I uh, am happy to support this. And want to just say thank you for for taking it and doing something with thank it. Thank you. Are there other are there other issues? So the two amendments uh, to our. Uh, Committee policy have been moved. Will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal. Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Huff. Aye. Huff, aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn, aye. Desonye. Aye. Desonye, aye. Harmon. Kehoe. Aye. Kehoe, aye. Oropesa. Aye. Oropesa, aye. Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Semidian. Seven right. zero. We have seven votes again. We're going to place the amendments to the committee policy on call until the absent member uh, in respect. So here goes the Lowenthal free parking garage. Or until you die. Until I die. Which may happen soon. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to take a five minute in, uh, recess now. We could. Yes. Yeah, let's okay, let's lift calls. Okay. Well, before we take the recess, let's lift calls. You, you've been here, so you don't need to. You're fine. Let's go. Item number one, SB 965, Desaulnier. Will the secretary Kurt. please indicate how the chair and the vice chair voted? Current vote 6-0. Chair I, vice chair I, Harmon, Kehoe. Kehoe I, Pavley. Pavley, I eight zero. That bill, that bill is out. We're going to close the roll. Senator Harmon has indicated he will not be joining us today. Next bill, SB eleven twenty eight, Senator Desaulnier, Common Interest Development. Current vote six zero. 
Chair I, Vice Chair I, Harmon. Pavley. Aye. Pavley I, Semidian. 7 0. That, bi that bill has seven votes. We're going to replace the call and uh, move on to the next. SB 1295, Senator Dutton, license plates. As amended, current vote 6 0. Chair I, Vice Chair has not voted. Huff. Which one's this? Dutton. Oh, that's Huff I, Harmon. Pavley. Aye. Pavley I, 8 0. Th that bill has eight votes. That bill is out. Next bill, SB 1299, Lowenthal. Current vote 5 1. Chair I, Vice Chair I, Harmon. Pavley. Pavley I, Semidian. 6 1. Bill has six votes. We'll replace the call on, S on SB 1299. Next bill, item number 5, SB 1395. Current vote 7 0. Chair I, Vice Chair I. And that bill is. Uh, to be referred to Rules Committee, I believe. Harmon. Pavley. Which bill was this? Alquist. Oh, yes. Aye. Pavley, aye. Current vote, oh, oh, vote 8 0. Bill has eight votes. That bill is out. Next bill, SB 1470, Senator Leno. We, still, we haven't voted on that yet. <laughs> okay. Then the uh, SCR 85, the consent calendar, I believe everybody was here for that. Is uh, right. Senator Semidian still is not. Okay, yeah. Senator Semidian is still, so we're, we'll keep the call on the consent calendar. Okay. Right now, where is, uh, is Greg going to come? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair? We're in recess. We're still in recess.